Pray fall silent. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to see so many people keen to talk about the topic we're going to broach today. Um, I'm Samir Padania. I am your moderator for the session. And um, in a minute or two, I will introduce our, frankly, um, intimidatingly wonderful panel. But first, I just wanted to talk about what this panel is, you know, why, why I sort of pulled this panel together. Um, we all, you know, the, this is an international journalism festival. We're talking about journalism first and foremost. And I think one of the themes around what journalism and journalism organizations and freelancers and everybody involved in the production of it is experiencing at the moment, or a huge number of people around the world are experiencing, is a lack of money. Um, it's the chronic demands of appearing sustainable, uh, demonstrating diverse revenue streams, tell me if anyone finds this familiar, um, identifying, recruiting, and retaining talent, uh, maintaining a solid and secure tech stack, increasingly important, ensuring editorial quality, doing the accounts, taking on freelance work to cross-subsidize your business, taking on credit card debt, personal loans, donations from friends and family to be able to keep going another week. I don't want to depress you, but I mean, you know, these are the reality, you know, of many, much of the media around the world. Um, and of course, there is a sharpened focus in recent years about the fate of journalism because, as we know, and as many parts of the festival are talking about, the resources for it are ever scarcer. And this further threatens media's ability to be able to deliver the thing that we all need and that society needs, public interest journalism, which is a public good, let me remind you, and therefore its ability to anchor the role of quality, independent information in society, which is also a public good. But it's not that, and what we're talking about today, is it's not just that the, the resources are scarce, but it's that they're concentrated in certain hands. So I think this is, this is the question that we want to talk about today, really. And that how they're released, and this was a direct quote from somebody working for an international um, NGO uh, in, a, in a country that I was working in, that how they're released, these, these resources, are set in a, quote, colonial mold. And a mold which, if it is not allowed to be broken, will deepen and entrench existing north-south inequalities even further and longer. This is what that person said. So I think from my work and what I'm looking at in a sort of cross-cutting way, I work independently within the funding ecosystem. You know, I think that there's a growing impatience among people all over the world and at all levels, even within countries, within northern countries as well, for that mold top to bottom to be broken. But, and this is, this is where I think we're going to get into this today, is that in other parts of development, these discussions are happening more rapidly and are in a more advanced state than they are in media development. You know, if you look at other parts of the development sector, you know, movements like Shift the Power um, and so on have, uh, are sort of happening now. They're built on many years of trying to shift who is, uh, who is in control of money, who is setting the incentives for the expenditure of money, who is deciding who gets the money. So today, with this panel, we're going to delve into these issues, the, the money, the resources, and who gets to make decisions about them. Um, with me, I've got Miro Milosevic, from left to my left to, or your, I don't know. <laughs> That's probably a colonial frame. Um, <laughs> but uh, Mira Milosevic from the Global Forum for Media Development, uh, Christine Mungai from Baraza Media Lab in Kenya, Nishant Lalwani from the International Fund for Public Interest Media, and Lina Atala from Madamasa in Egypt. So um, I wanted to come first to Christine and Lina, given that you're in situations where, you know, you're at the heart of these sorts of confluences. Can you each give us a sense in you know, a couple of minutes really about what those forces and what those forces are and how they're coming to bear on you and the work you're trying to do? Maybe Christine first. 
Thanks, Amir. Um, so for me, from my vantage point in Nairobi, Kenya, I run a media lab, uh, Baraza Media Lab. Um, we're a hub for the ecosystem, um, providing physical space, providing uh, programs um, and community convenings for, for uh, freelance journalists and also for folks in new media. I'm talking about podcasters, YouTubers, and um, that whole spectrum of what is referred to as content creators. Um, so for us, uh, Samir, you said that um, funding is scarce. And for me, I will nuance that a bit, that it is scarce, but also certain types of funding is abundant. Um, it's so abundant that it's impossible for organizations like mine to absorb it because it is supply side driven, which means that it's not coming from a response to our own needs, but really it's a response for certain organizations to spend money. And so they kind of push it to us, right? But that is so insidious because it creates very perverse incentives and a very um, dysfunctional ecosystem at the end of the day. Because supply side driven things are really corrupting. Let me put it that way. Let me use that word because what, what they do is that they, it complicates the mission, the purpose, our attention, even hiring. We end up hiring certain kinds of like program officers to do certain kinds of programmatic work because this is what supply side driven funds actually create. Um, but on the other hand, um, funding to actually do impactful work is the one that is really scarce, right? And I'm just talking about even something just as simple as journalism, just doing the journalism. That's the kind of funding that's scarce. But the one that's abundant is a lot more like doing intermediary or adjacent work. So I'm talking about funding to do trainings, mentorships, fellowships, capacity building, all sorts of things, right? That assumes that um, the media ecosystem in a place like Kenya and regionally needs help to develop. It needs some kind of support to mature or to grow, right? But the, the reality is that we are there, we've been doing the work, we understand the landscape. Um, what um, these organizations have that we don't have is just money. And money is not expertise, right? Money is not knowledge. Money does not come with any kind of like insight or wisdom or even information, right? And it really annoys me that um, folks with money actually assume that they know things. But money is not knowledge. Um, Christine, the if I can like follow up on that, I mean that show-stopping uh, <laughs> quote. Um, in when I was last in Nairobi, I was talking to a, an old friend and colleague, and she said to me, um, I, you know, I said, "Oh, how's it going?" And she said, "Yeah, it's fine." I said, "You know, ha how's the health reporting going?" She said, "Oh no, I'm not a health reporter anymore. I'm a democracy reporter now." <laughs> and I said, "Oh, like what do you mean?" And she said, "Well." Yeah, first I was a health reporter, then I was a science reporter, then after that I was an inequality reporter, and then I was on a reporter on women's rights, and now I'm a democracy reporter, because that's where the funding was. Correct. Is that and, the sort of next, dynamic that next she's going to be a climate reporter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the, the other thing that I noticed, and we, you know, when, when I was in Nairobi and we ran together the, the Kenya Funders Forum, um, one of the things that I, the pre-research that I did was try and map how many landscape reports there had been in Kenya in the last five years. I don't know if you remember the number. It was 27. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the aggregate amount was spent on that, but that's quite a lot of reports in five years, you know, to have about one country as opposed to programmatic work. And, and just to clarify, Samir, to um, our audience, the landscape report is basically like, oh, we don't know much about the media ecosystem. Let's commission a report to understand the players and who's where and, and what's happening. 27 ecosystem reports have been commissioned in five years. That's what I mean. Money is not knowledge. Like <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Lena, how about where does it look from where you sit? Um, 
uh, thank you, Samia. It's uh, it's a bit hard to speak after Christina. <laughs> I was <laughs> touché, but um, so basically, I I come from Egypt uh, and I um, I operate in an ecosystem of independent independent media organizations that have been there for the last ten years. Uh, they have tapped into all sorts of um, developmental money that is uh, possible, you know, expanding cycles of uh, funding to, you know, um, to, to uh, uh, expanding them over and over when, you know, it was hard at moments to expand them. Um, so until, you know, it, we realized at some point, um, as in we, as in the network of uh, of media organizations, that you know there is something that's that's not working. Because, honestly speaking, the the impact that we've managed to do uh, in the last ten years as independent media newsrooms um, in the region is is comparable to the impact of legacy media. I will have to say. I don't want to sound too snob here, but it is comparable in many ways. Um, except that you know the resources are not comparable, and except that we have to year after year uh, go and secure um, the funding for our, our organizations, and at the same time we have to keep saying the good old messages of you know we we don't need the programmatic investment of any sort uh, because you know the best investment you can do is into these institutions to build themselves up. Uh, we live in a context where there is a major institutional deficit. Um, these institutions are so well uh, um, um, equipped to build themselves up and to deliver uh, quality journalism. But you know, we came to the realization that that pot, uh, which is a very political pot, um, is running out not by the doing of our donors who are uh, very committed to us, but by governments that support um, this developmental money. And, you know, we need to find other ways. And this is how ideas for coming together and fighting to find uh, new money, um, there is new money out there to grab, um, be it philanthropy money, be it... Uh, uh, money that was not meant to be spent on uh, media endeavors, but at the same time that, you know, there is some convincing that can be done to to go and grab that kind of money. Uh, money that can be also governed with, you know, very little overhead and most of it uh, can go um, to the organizations themselves. Uh, money that doesn't have hefty political liabilities uh, in the complex moment we live in right now is what we need to be looking for at this point. Uh, many people are telling us this is a, uh, this is a very difficult um, a job, but honestly speaking, I'm someone who comes from Egypt um, with colleagues. I set up a media in the most uh, difficult of circumstances. Uh, like Christina said, I don't think there is a, a problem of money, and I always say, of abundance of money, and I always say that it would be laughable that our organizations are not shut down by our authoritarian rulers, but by the lack of uh, of funding. So this is this is where comes the need to you know take the matters into our own hands and uh, let the journalists actually, just like we establish these institutions from scratch, um, you know find uh, you know the, the the backbone funding that would keep them alive and that would keep um, others um, with us alive. And the idea, the last thing I'll say is that um, we feel capable of doing this right now because it's been 10 years we are doing this. I know 10 years is not a lot, um, but we've seen a lot in these 10 years and we've you know, navigated this cartography of funding. So we feel also responsible to think of this new mechanism for those of us who are yet to start their 10 years or are halfway through the 10 years. Uh, we feel like there is accumulated knowledge and intelligence and reach out and impact that should be put to use to create uh, a new mechanism of some sort. Okay, I mean, one, one quick follow-up, which is that this time last year, um, I was talking to a bunch of different people in the MENA region, and one of the one of the things that came out was that they th there was a sort of implication that a, a particular donor, I don't know which one, had said relatively openly that they felt that they were going to withdraw from the region, that they had in fact described it as a lost cause, and I don't and I don't know 
either how true that is, but even the perception of that being sort of abroad in the field, I think is a pretty extraordinary one. And so I'm curious about how, if you can give us a you know, minute or two on, 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 you know, on that sort of environment and how people are relating to the region in terms of funding and so on. You know, you talked a little bit about governments, but I mean, yeah. Y yeah, I guess uh, decolonizing funding is, is part of, you know, decolonizing everything around us, um, including uh, that very decision-making process that deems uh, certain regions worthy of investments while others are not. I mean, again, th there was an opportunity 10 years ago when we started working, when everybody believed in the Arab Spring and the, you know, potential of democracy um, in our part of the world, but, you know, we just came from Brussels and we were told openly by uh, some European uh, policy makers that, um, you know, the best bet for us as Europeans right now is your governments and not yourselves, and you better find ways to survive uh, within these governments if you manage to survive. So, but, you know, these people, um, as evil as we think uh, they are, are not the people who are directly funding us, but they do affect the funding ecosystem, and it's these people who, you know, give us the steam to think away from them and to think of other possibilities that are out there because, you know, it can't just be, I can't be seen as an opportunity for someone. Um, I want to decide that I am uh, the opportunity for my own people, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Mira. Samir. <laughs> <laughs> so you represent a global network. Mm -hmm but one that was sort of, you know, emerged from the media development sphere as a way of, you know, bringing it together. You know, there were sort of many, there were, there were a group of sort of northern-based organizations that were sort of partly mm -hmm. helping establish it, but also, you know, many organizations around the world. So can you tell us a little bit about that environment, the sort of mm -hmm. GFMD environment, its trajectory, mm -hmm. how it has changed from, I mean, it's, I think, 20 years next year, is that right? Yeah, 20 years right. next year, so yeah. Right, yeah. Yes. And also about the bigger picture, about sort of the numbers we're talking about and the money and so on, you know. Yeah, I'll try it yeah. in three minutes. <laughs> no, you can take a little bit more. No, no. Um, yeah, so uh, just to, to, to get back to what uh, uh, Christina and Lena uh, were saying, uh, this is something that our members, and we at the moment have uh, around 200 yeah members and both Lena and Christina are member organizations of GFMD uh, and these kind of stories we've been hearing anecdotally in all the regions where media support and journalism support was happening uh, over the last I think 30 years since the field kind of established itself and the network uh, has been established exactly for those reasons because some of the implementers came to Tunisia and found that there are three other organizations doing that same work with the same people who had to then write three same reports. Now the problem is that 25 years later, that same practice continued happening. And somewhere around 2018, I came to the organization 2017, we said, okay, well, you know, we have all this anecdotal evidence, but let's see what is the evidence that we can gather more systematically about these practices, and then let's see what we can do, because our, our role is to provide the platform for this community to change practices, not just to kind of identify what the problem is. And we've done that systematically over the last five years, and you can see here the report that we've done in the summer last year that kind of summarizes all the practices of how we support media in different countries that have the elements of you know, what you define that as uh, colonial practices or unequal power, uh, unequal access, uh, um, no needs assessment not coming from the bottom up, supply driven support and things like that. So what we've done was actually change things on two levels. One is within the organization. We made sure that we now have a new structure that is representative of this sector truly and that everyone has 
equal opportunity to participate in different policy fora. And this needs to be for things to change. They, they need systems, institutions, and processes. And it's a, del a deliberative process where now we have a board that has regional representation that truly makes sense. We have regional events so that you know, we uh, cooperate with our members to organize a meeting around what's happening in the Middle East at the moment, Chatham House rules, uh, confidentially, etc. So that's within the organization. We also have a practice where for conferences like this, an important policy for like UN, where Summit of the Future is currently being planned. We have a membership fund that's not funded by one member or one donor. So it's not um, uh, a power disbalance in any way. No, community funds community to represent us. And we then fund our members in Kenya, in Namibia, in uh, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, to come to global conferences and tell these stories. So that's one side of the story. The other side of the story, uh, the, the assistance that we talk about is official development assistance mostly. So those are those practices that we are talking about today. There is a, another part of the sector which is private funder that have you know, their own dynamics and issues. So we've identified that the only place in the world where donors sit with some kind of official commitment and structure to change practices is OSCD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And they're the only ones who systematically collect data to see who's investing, where they're investing, and uh, you know, how much goes where and in what way. And I know this is boring and tedious and it takes forever, but it needed to be done. So we took this evidence and then did two years of consultation around the world with 250 organizations, I don't know how many conferences, and started the process to establish something called principles for, for effective media support and information environment. And I think things just came together Donors also felt that it's the right time to change practices or do, do them better and also to establish a document for the first time that all the major donors subscribe to. And so to cut the long story short, in March this year, uh, the official development assistance committee of the OECD has adopted the principles for effective media support that actually address a lot of these issues and I really would like you to all read it and see. So that document now exists and all the major donors have them in, in their headquarters and every single organization around the world that's funded by donors can take that and say to local donor, well listen, this is not in line with this practice. Of course now it will take time to implement those, uh, but they are there. I don't think that they will you know, change the world immediately. It's just that our job is to do policy and create those policy documents that allow practices to change from the bottom up. So we are offering that hammer that you can use to break that glass that was there uh, for too long. I can talk about the numbers a bit later. Sure, if you want. You have, uh, I think, a sub-question. No. Oh. I want you to talk about the numbers. Ah, root, right. us in, root us in the money. Yeah, so... Um, the money, of course, you know, comes with implied power, right? And implied inferences of, you know, that money also brings, as you say, knowledge. Unfortunately, the money, uh, uh, you know, in this sector is very small and it has been. So official development assistance invests around 0.3% in whatever is called media and information ecosystem. And uh, these codes are very complicated, but I at least if you use the same methodology every year, you kind of get a picture. And it's growing a bit, but it's flat. It's anywhere between 300 and 500 million per year. So last year, I think dollars. It's dollars, yes. And so uh, that's that's the reality. And I know you know we've tried everything, and I know uh, you know all the colleagues are lobbying for years for that to to grow. Uh, but uh, yeah, the situation at the moment in the world, unfortunately, is such that uh, it will be very, very difficult, uh, you know, to, to, to grow that money. Uh, I can talk about the structure if you like. Yeah, of that funding. 
Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. W w what goes where. Right, so what OSCD does is they put together uh, information uh, in, and kind of media uh, investment together with something that is infrastructural investment. And that's investment into kind of transmitters, telecom towers, and broadcast equipment, and digital. And that uh, is actually more than 50% of all the help that goes to so-called media and information environment in there. So, but that chunk of money is additional 600 million. It's bigger than media. However, it's interesting. That money doesn't come with strings attached. Now, fast forward next 10 years where that money will be funding AI infrastructure. And if it doesn't have any human rights uh, principles attached to it, uh, then, uh, you know, all those governments, oh, that money goes to governments, by the way, uh, local governments who then build infrastructure that can be captured. So that's one side of the story. On the other side of the story, media organizations themselves get around 10% of, 8% of all that money. However, just to clarify, because yesterday there, there was a misunderstanding. That's 8% of that whole uh, budget that includes infrastructure. So 50 something, let's say 7% goes to recipient governments for infrastructure mostly. 27% have to take a look at this. 27% of, of that money uh, is going to um, organizations and institutions based in donor countries. So 27 goes to the donor countries, but those donor countries spend that within the ministries, public institutions, think tanks, and other organizations. The, another thing that, you know, yesterday you said 90% goes to it. No, only 15% of the funding is delivered through NGOs, universities, research institutions, both in recipient and donors countries. So just to okay. clear, it's important to know that that power uh, is actually you know, distributed among the NGOs yep. and media in not, if you look at the numbers, in not so- Not quite as- Unequal way, in a way, because a so lot of that- So we can just uh, pack up and go home. No, well, no, I'm a, just a lot of that is actually then goes to, uh, I don't know, ethical councils, media, and yeah. 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 Uh, so it's, it's complicated, I know, it's boring, but uh, it's, no, important. It's, important right. it's important to get it right because evidence informs our actions and policy, yeah. and for us to change it for the better. We have to be more precise. So on that... Yeah. Coming, thank you, Mira, because it's important to understand what we're dealing with and what we're grappling with and which bits of the pot we can shift and which bits we can't and where we need to apply and exercise accountability in different ways. So one of those areas is around how governments spend. And so I want to come to Nishant from IFPIM. Can you, so what among these dynamics that Lena, Christine and Mira have talked about, what's IFPIM's role in because it's a new type of institution. You know, what, what's IFPRIM's role and additionality within that landscape? Can we talk about the 8%? <laughs> Isn't it criminal? I mean, you're saying of all the foreign aid that the, the small amount of foreign aid that um, all of the OECD governments combined have sort of scraped together to support media, 8% goes to media organizations in, in those focus countries. I mean, if you talk about how other sectors, um, like I'm surprised that, maybe it's just because this report's being published now, but I'm so, this, is, this is kind of really a big news in terms of accountability and in terms of policy, I think. Like, this would not work in global health or in education if this was the case. And, you know, every, every um, you know, media conference you go to, uh, as you were highlighting at the beginning, people talk about the amount of money which is needed to support media organizations, uh, core funding, the kind of the journalism that needs to happen and needs to be decided by the organizations who are actually serving those audiences, uh, not by those in donor capitals. And 80%, which is just $40 million a year, um, goes to support 
organizations to do that. And that's not even what's core. Some of it's, some of it's you know, comes with a lot of strings attached, as, as, as Christine and Lena were saying. Um, so, I mean, in a nutshell, if PIM's been desi designed to solve that problem, I mean, we are trying to, we're, so uh, for those um, uh, who might not know, the International Fund for Public Interest Media is a new global fund. It's a multilateral organization that's designed to support um, journalism in low and middle income countries and try and develop a new paradigm of economic resilience for journalism um, in those countries. Um, we, uh, we launched last year, coming up to our first year anniversary on World Press Freedom Day. We're funded 70% by um, governments, um, including you know, the US and France and Sweden, Denmark and others, um, corporates and philanthropies, including Luminate and Google and um, uh, Ned and so on. Um, what we've done is um, we've laid out a plan for you know, the amount of funding that we think is required to make a dent on this problem of economic resilience for media organizations. And um, like, other, like some other organizations, we, we believe that that 0.3% of foreign aid needs to increase to at least 1% of foreign aid. I mean, mis- and disinformation, election integrity, funding uh, for media in some cases is a huge a hugely important political issue for many um, democratic politicians at a minimum, and yet they're not putting their money where their, their mouth is, right? Um, even 1% is a tiny contribution compared to the kind of the political importance of this issue. And if we did 1%, that would be an additional billion dollars a year, um, which is not, um, it's not gonna solve the problem, but it's certainly gonna start to be able to resource the sector appropriately. Of course, like the way in which that money is distributed as, as Christine was saying, is not just, um, not just important, it's everything. It's everything. Um, and so at IFPIM, we focus on um, giving core funding to media organizations. Um, about 85% of our current funds go um, uh, to media organizations, and the remainder is focused on some systems change efforts, um, including things like news bargaining codes and AI licensing, national funds for journalism, which, which could actually contribute to kind of longer term sustainability. Um, and in, 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 in the way we give money, we always start with the question of, well, what do you know? We ask organizations, what do you need money for? Um, how, how would you like to use it? What are the audience needs that you're trying to serve? What, trying to, what investments are you trying to make in order to um, support kind of the, the financial resilience of your organization? And then, um, you know, we may or may not, uh, let's say, when making our assessments, we may or may not always agree that it's a plan worth supporting, but the plan will come from those organizations and we will, we will back it um, where, wherever we can. And I think that's, that's the approach that I think is, um, uh, is, is kind of essential to ensuring that we're, we're not making decisions that, um, that trickle down. And can I ask, I mean, I know that at the outset you were very clear as if PIM that you wanted to unlock new money. Mm -hmm. How, you know, what's, what's that trajectory and conversation been like and how is it changing in the context that, you know, it's very very context that we're talking about. So, I mean, um, you know, all of our funders have told us that um, this money, and in some cases, you know, we've asked for written confirmation, um, like from the US government, for example, um, that this money is new money to support media and won't be cannibalizing other funds because that would be undermining, I think, the um, uh, the mission that we've laid out. I think a number of the organizations funding us um, would not, we know for a fact they wouldn't be funding media if, if PIM didn't exist. Um, so the Taiwanese government, for example, don't really fund media outside the country, um, but have supported us, um, as well as um, other organizations like, uh, other governments, sorry, like, like Estonia, um, who don't do a lot of work funding work outside um, their, their um, Does the Italian government give money yet? No, no, we'd... we'd um, Anyone here? Be, <laughs> um, be interested in that conversation. <laughs> and then, I mean, I think, I think some of the more interesting conversations, you know, we're an active, active, um, actively engaged in the government career, for example, mm. we were at the Summit for Democracy last month in Seoul, um, and there's other governments like that who clearly are looking, they're waiting for us to um, have international organization status, which should happen this year before um, they, can, they can support us, but we hope that, that um, that'll happen soon. So, I mean, the governance of our organization is kind of crucial to ensuring that donors don't 
have a say in the grants that we give. Um, and you know, our board is made up entirely of independent experts. It's chaired by Maria Ressa and Mark Thompson, who leads CNN. Um, and uh, it has representatives from all of our regions as well. Sure. And so that way donors can give us money um, without necessarily having control over our strategy. And, and in terms of the proportion of the funds that you receive and that you give out, what's, what, what's the difference in terms of that? You know, when we're talking about balance of funds, you know, you're sort of saying like 8% in the other figures we were just talking about, reaches media on the ground. What's that proportion within IFPIN's own... You mean in terms of what amount is given in grants? Yeah, how much of the money that you get yes. goes out back yes, so out to directly to sort of media organisations or ecosystems? And this year we're looking at about seventy percent um, that goes to media organisations. Our goal is eighty. Um, the uh, the only issue at the moment is that we're not really at scale. So you know we're still hiring, we're still growing. Um, we're working across thirty nine countries right now with a relatively lean team, but. I hope within 18 to 24 months, we're operating at the scale where we can achieve that um, uh, a closer to 80% ratio. Yeah. Okay, thank you. What I wanted to do before we come to this full to bursting audience um, or room of comrades um, is just to ask you whether you have questions for each other. I mean, do you, as you know, you're sort of listening to each other and you're each occupying different parts of the ecosystem, different places, different kinds of interlocutors. Do you have questions for each other? Are there I have a question for Lena and Christine, but I don't know if you want to answer. Just go ahead. You know, a lot of the um, uh, kind of, a lot of global organizations working on media support focus on training and capacity building. Um, and, um, you know, we, we don't really do that, but there are other organizations to do that. And I wanted to ask um, what, what your le decolonization lens is on that approach, whether you can, whether it can be done in a way that you feel is uh, demand-driven. Um, so interested in your views on that. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, it can be done. Um, just to quickly answer that and to also give an anecdote. Um, I think rapid change can actually happen. Like change can actually happen quickly because the power is in the hands of these organizations that are headquartered in the global world. They can just decide to do things differently. For example, Mackenzie Scott is just giving away money. You know, she's giving it away quickly and she's giving away lots of it, right? And um, it turns out that one person can just decide to do things differently, right? I, I hope and, she's watching. <laughs> and yeah, fund us please. Um, but, but, but my point is that a lot of, a lot of what happens um, in this space is actually governed by like conventions or like these normative ideas that things should happen in a particular way, that an application form should look the way it does, or you should go through like some rounds of like interviews or whatever to get certain kinds of funding, right? Like those things are actually man-made. They were not like given on Mount Sinai with like the Ten Commandments, right? And change can happen if people just decide to change. And the anecdote that I have is that we were in, um, there was a program that we, I, uh, Baraza was fundraising for um, with an organization, uh, sorry, with a media development organization headquartered in the Global North. I, I hope that's vague enough so that they don't know that I'm talking about them. Um, so they approached us to partner, look at my air quotes, partner with them on uh, a certain program and what they wanted us to do was joint fundraising, right? So we fundraise, they fundraise, and then we spend the money together in this program and that was fine. Um, so they fundraised zero dollars and we fundraised um, a good number of dollars, <laughs> um, five figures of dollars. Um, and, you know, what they said when, when we um, raised this money is that we had to send the money to them. Like, we had to deposit the money in their account, and then they would come up with a budget on how it's spent, which was completely ridiculous. Like, this is France Afrique in media, right? Like, where, sorry, sorry to the French. Um, where you basically, you actually have resources that you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to spend your own resources. They said we had to hand over the money that we had fundraised 
and that they would decide what they would do with it, right? As regards this program. And I'm, for, for me, I'm like, those are decisions that people made, right? And they can make different decisions if they wanted to. Lena, did you have a... <laughs> I'm a bit critical of uh, of uh, money spent on training or or conditioned on uh, spending it on uh, training by either intermediaries or donor organizations in general because I think um, I mean again our experience in in, in the network in the region is that uh, we've seen so much money being poured into such programming. Um, and honestly, very little impact. Um, and it's easy to negate what's there, uh, more difficult to, to see uh, what is the alternative, but also we are able to provide alternatives. And for me, you know, the two ways that have been uh, working is A, the best training for journalists in the region and the best training for journalists in general is on the job, is for these people to be able to be, um, you know, uh, incorporated in newsrooms and, um, you know, start as interns and then make their way up and, you know, only if um, there are institutions and organizations working properly and being able to expand can these interns end up being, being, um, uh, being hired, and this is our experience today. The chief editor of Madamos started off as a junior editor ten years ago, um, you know, and moved from junior to chief investigator, uh, from to, to senior reporter to chief investigator to managing editor, and now he's the chief editor. And then the other thing is that we have invested a lot more time in designing our own. Um, schooling for journalism because we're also seeing um, how the practice needs to be decolonized, um, the practice needs to be uh, rooted back into uh, certain historical, political and social contexts. It's um, increasingly being taken away from these contexts. Uh, um, it's increasingly being uh, very tech deterministic uh, in its approach. And that's why, for example, we started in our network what we call the Counter Academy for Arab Journalism, where, you know, a bunch of scholars, journalists, artists, writers come together um, to develop a year-long program uh, where we work with journalists, but we have full control over, over this, uh, this program. And again, we have a focus on placement, so it's not just that we train people, but we make sure that we find ways to place them in our organizations in the end. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just to add that, uh, uh, it seems to me that the time is right for local organizations to take power and not only just ask for core funding and but flip the relationship which you know we have now examples for instance in Lebanon when there was uh, explosion in the port uh, local foundation skies uh, uh, center has uh, together with our partners IMS and others done bottom-up, uh, you know, needs assessment, gathered all the donors, they created an emergency fund, did it together, and everyone cooperated. They insisted they have one report. It's possible you have Ukraine Media Fund that is uh, working with German Marshall Fund to do the same. I mean, we had a session, you, you had a session yesterday talking about new initiatives about, yeah, forming uh, and new national funds. So I think that you know the time is ripe, and that you know, there, there are bases at the moment to to do this. Again, these policies that we do together are also tools to push back on some of the practices that definitely need to change. Okay, thanks. I do. Um, we have about five minutes left. I apologize, but I think you would agree. I hope that these are all very, very interesting, eloquent, extraordinary people with insights that we all need to hear. Um, as much as your questions must be fantastic. And all the ones that won't be asked, I'm sure will be asked out there. Um, so can we take, are there questions in the room? And can the uh, people with microphones wave? Okay. Okay. So we have one there, one here, and then one more. One here. All right. Thank you so much and for the. Please make the question crisp. Very crisp. <laughs> um, I'm a, a China reporter. 
And my question is for Christine. Um, we just heard your, heard your assessment about Global North uh, financing structures. China is uh, nowadays a very large and important player in the Global South. Um, also very active in uh, financing all sorts of projects, including media and journalism. And I'm just really curious, how do you assess China as a player in this field in the Global South? compared to the Global North partners that you just elaborated on. Thank you. How, how do I assess China? How? In what sense? Well, uh, are they an active player? Are they an active funder? Uh, do they do that in another style than the Global North? Because China is uh, championing itself as, uh, well, a leading nation in the Global South. Okay. We'll take all three questions and then we'll... Okay. Do you want to just ask this one and then we'll come to you and then... Hi everyone, my name is Ankur. I run a small outlet called Queer Beat in India covering LGBTQ rights. Just uh, following up on what Christine and Lena said, uh, that there is a lot of money and it's concentrated, say, on trainings. Another thing that we keep hearing is that do a festival or an event and then get people together. Uh, and, but what we really need is money for journalists to stay longer on the field, to do the stories. What I want to ask is that what can independent organizations like mine do, uh, um, just from a more practical level to get money for core funding, what, can, what kind of questions do we ask uh, when they are coming for festival? Can we say we don't need the money for festival, we need it for core funding? What can we do as an organization to just flip the conversation? Okay, thanks. And then, do you want to? I'm a very sparse yeah. talker. So my name is Dinesh. I come from the Wit Center for Journalism in Johannesburg, South Africa. Just a comment to say that that question that Nishant raised about the decolonial lens must also reflect on impact uh, and how funders are measuring impact and what they expect to come out of it. Because one story, for example, can have a massive impact where a body of work over 20 years may not. We're also investing in people now, not just newsrooms, because newsrooms in the global south are vastly changing. They may not exist in 10 to 20 years, but those people with journalism will continue to exist. Thank you. So I think three, three things. One, I think maybe the question you've asked, Ankur, is possibly the topic of another session, an entire hour, but, um, or a clinic maybe, um, you know, but I, you know, it's taken well. I, th I think the two questions around that sort of impact and, and so on, I think are pretty apposite, but also the um, China, but also Russia, Gulf states, etc. that paradigm. In the last couple of minutes, do you have thoughts on those? Or if you want to answer Uncle's question as well, please just tell him how to get more money. Um, I think Lena can also uh, speak to this, uh, but China is a player, um, just like the other um, you know, countries and um, sources that you talk about. Um, I think I can only state the obvious, that China is a player and that it's different from the global north. Um, I'm not saying that it's better. Better is... Uh, a kind of like a, uh, what can I say, uh, ranking or hierarchy that um, I don't think is in our interest to do. Um, you know, the, the funding players can rank themselves and decide where they fall on the ranking. Um, it's just different. But for us um, in, in Nairobi, we tend to be on the underside of these kind of power plays, right? that sometimes we end up being caught up in things that don't even concern us. And, and folks expect us to take sides in, in conflicts that have nothing to do with us. Um, and that's very frustrating um, on our end because what we are here to do is journalism in the public interest, not to prop up some weird like global Olympics power play thing going on, um, um, which really does not have does not have like uh, genuine or authentic kind of input from us, but instead that we are just some kind of proxy battleground, some playing field for people to project their fantasies on. Uh, Christine's also going to be doing stand up all week. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lena. <coughs> I mean, very quickly, uh, like I think uh, 
Chinese Gulf um, Russian funding um, in a place like uh, Egypt and the entire region is uh, certainly not centered on independent media as they are more, much more interested in the new administrative capital that our president has been investing in and, um, and also go gold finds in Sudan and other forms of extraction. So I don't think uh, we fall within uh, that map. There is a growing interest in media funding and cultural funding from, uh, from the Gulf. But again, uh, to what extent um, it sits at the back of uh, progressive and critical thinking projects is a big question mark. There is much more interest in entertainment and a lot more things that go into the direction of the death of politics, which is precisely what we're fighting against. Thanks. Nishan, Mira, did you have anything on the on either those or the um, or the sort of reframing of impact and so on? Nishan, go ahead and uh, I think I think Dinesh makes a great point around um, the reframing of impact and certainly um, I mean look at uh, Gupta leaks in South Africa, for example, and Amo Bagane's work. I mean, one or two stories that had a huge impact there um, from a small organization. And that's really the, that's the joy of the media space, is that you can have outsized impact um, with uh, even, even relatively small players. I think that um, just thinking about how you design for that, you know, something we haven't talked about a lot is, um, is about how we shift power. Um, you know, and how we ensure that every, let's say in my case, um, at IFPIM, every grant lead or regional director um, or board member, you know, knows that the people best placed to make these decisions are either in the contexts in which the audiences are being served or, or not even within IFPIM at all, you know, but within those needs are being presented to us. And, you know, something that uh, at least I've learned while trying to, to, to take a decolonized approach into, into aid and funding is that it's not just uh, an activity, it's, it's, the whole, it's the whole piece. And you know, every single person we've hired at IFPIM, every single board member, um, we've tried to essentially filter to ensure that this is something they care deeply about. Um, because without, it's, it's already a massive struggle to try and change the way that aid works. So if you don't have every person representing the fund really believing in this, um, then you don't get the kind of results which, um, which we've been calling for. Mira, last thought. Yeah, on the, um, I'm skipping impact, yes, last thought. Um, uh, getting money together is the only way. Uh, so you have, for instance, Ajor in Brazil was here, Maya Forrest did, gave the example how m her members come together and look for establishing the fund. Uh, other initiatives just happened, Cloud uh, Journalism Alliance of Investigative Data Journalism Associations came together to, to search for ways to access cloud uh, infrastructure uh, at uh, better conditions. So only together and through uh, institutions, well, through organizations like ours, please come Come forward and we'll facilitate whatever we can facilitate for you to be stronger together. Thank you. One last thing I want to say is that I think you've heard from our colleagues here that it's really not a choice anymore to kind of, you know, whether you're a funder, you're an intermediary, you're a researcher, a consultant. I work as a consultant often. We don't have time or latitude to compromise anymore. We don't have the more, you know, we don't have the latitude to compromise and keep reinforcing existing paradigms, existing power structures, if you're not actively working to actually dismantle and shift, then you are a part of the problem. And I say that as editorializing on this panel, but I do genuinely believe that from having worked with people over the last two, three years. And I think I'm, you know, I think this has got some very you know, we've heard lots of very powerful examples and so on, but I, I really do urge you, wherever it is you're working, whatever it is you're doing, to take this as very, very seriously, because we don't have a lot of time, and there are a lot of media that are thin tissue of public interest that we need to save and support. Thank you.